Hello everybody, um, I'm Charlotte Constance from Conductor. Unfortunately, our host has had uh, technical difficulties, um, Robin. Uh, he should be joining us any moment now. Um, so we thought we would kick off and welcome you all to the future of offices. Um, we'll tell you a bit about ourselves and then um, just crack on with our first presentation. So as I said, I'm Charlotte Constance. Um, I run a consultancy called Conductor. We bring science and soul to spaces and places. So we are looking at, on one hand, data, research and insights. And then we're looking at how we convert those and in interpret those into what we call human-led insight that can be used um, to bring the, the soul and the community aspect um, to the spaces and places that we inhabit. Um, so my take on it, um, on this conversation today is very much a, a people first, a human first, um, first principles. Um, Stephen. Afternoon, Stephen Lewis. I'm the MD of HFD Property Group, which is the development arm of HFD Group. So I'll contribute a little bit today on our experience uh, of delivering some offices. Hello, Robin. We're just introducing ourselves. Elaine. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Elaine Russell. I head up the UK offices research team at JLL. Um, so we provide um, advice to clients on recent trends and um, the outlook for the UK office market. I'm going to be setting the scene with a, a 10 minute uh, presentation um, looking at the kind of pointers for where the, uh, the UK office market is going, um, looking at it from kind of the both employee and employees perspective um, and what this might mean for office demand. I'll hand back to Robin and he can do his, his ori original intro now. Uh, am I here? Is, uh... <laughs> In the nightmare scenario where you wake up in cold sweats, I've just had the nightmare scenario of my Wi-Fi dropping out. So apologies, everybody, for my um, late start. And um, thank you to our various panellists for introducing themselves. I think by way of background, uh, this event pencilled in the diary a couple of times before we settled on today's date. And if I'm being honest, what my concern was, was that perhaps we're a wee bit late onto this debate, or maybe that there's nothing new to say. But there's a couple of things, however, that have happened in the last couple of days that I think have confirmed to me that we're in the midst of an office evolution here, and this discussion will remain current for a while. Firstly, I've spent time over the last week or two catching up with people getting out and about. Um, and what struck me is that the perception of the benefit of home working doesn't really come close to the energy and interaction of being in the office environment once more. The cooperation, collaboration and creativity that an office can provide will never be matched by the screen time call. But the question that it remains, I suppose, is what is the perfect blend of this? And the second point was a headline on my BBC News app first thing this morning. And that stated that 70% of staff want to keep home working. The detail of this article isn't really as important as the prominence it was given on my newsfeed. And the fact that the BBC commissioned a survey reminds us that this isn't just about real estate investment or property development or even business management. This runs throughout the culture of work uh, for a significant number of workers across the UK. And today we're going to debate this from three different angles. We're going to look at the research behind the property trades. We're going to try to better understand the perspective of the indiv individual and in particular what makes them thrive. And then we're also going to get an insight of the implications for a real estate investor and developer. And um, you've had the introductions, but before we start, I'd like to run three quick polls. Uh, technology will always let you down, so I'm entirely waiting for this to fail, but hopefully we'll have three polls that we can put up in front of you. Now, so if you can get your fingers ready to react to these, but what we're really going to ask is um, what you want to happen, uh, what you think will happen and what you think we, your employer will want to happen. So the first of these questions is, in six months' time, and assuming no significant restrictions, how much time do you want to spend in the office? What's your ideal? Um, all of the time, more than half the time, half the time, less than half the time, or none of the time. So if you're working on three days a week, make it apply to you. If you're five days a week, work it on five days, four days, three days, two days, and so on and so forth. But if you can answer that from your own perspective, we'll give it another five or 10 seconds and then we'll move on to the next one. And the next one is how much time you think 
you'll spend in the office. So the first one's what you really want. The second one is what you think will happen. Where do you think your office time will be? And that is, again, all the time, more than half, half, less than half, or none. And again, if you're five days a week, then assume that to be five days, four days, three days, two days, and so on. Um, but that is what you think you will need to do in the office as opposed to what you want. And then finally, question three is, assuming no significant restrictions, how much time do you think your employer want you to spend in the office? So from your employer's perspective, Will it be the same as what you want or do you think they will want you in more or do you think they'll want you to work from home all of the time? So what we're trying to do with this, and we'll come back to these answers later, but what we're really trying to get is what you want, what you think will happen and what you think will be either imposing you or asked of you. Um, and we'll move now on to the, um, to the presentations, but we'll come back to those polls later and see what that reveals about um, where we think we will be in spring of next year, assuming no significant restrictions. So moving on, I will assume that all the uh, introductions have been done and thank you to the panel for introducing yourselves. But I'll now ask uh, Elaine Russell to give us the, the, the JLL research on the future of offices. So I've got about 10 minutes just to, to run through uh, kind of the future of office demand. As I said at the very beginning, um, I'm just gonna really kind of set the scene for the discussion that comes later. So from a JLL perspective, we have identified six key factors that are influential in shaping the future of office demand. And they're shown here on screen. So the, they're kind of working from home, office density, its impact on um, office design, the implementation of technology in the workplace. And then when we start to come down to kind of more local markets, I think uh, the implement, impl sorry, I can't my teeth in, implications of those, uh, those individual market dynamics start to include things like local amenities, uh, and green space and commuting patterns. I think it's really worth pointing out that most of these trends were evident before the pandemic, but that COVID-19 has really just accelerated their impact. And given that I've only got 10 minutes, um, I'm just really gonna focus on those top three uh, factors. So I think the move to home working has probably been the biggest shift in working patterns that any of us on, on this call have probably seen in our, in our working lives. Um, and the expectation is that the pandemic is going to um, provide uh, or prove to be a catalyst, I suppose, for the acceleration and widespread adoption of hybrid working. And there are numerous surveys out there. And Robin's just obviously just referenced the, the BBC Gallup survey that was put out yesterday. as surveys that show uh, that most people want to work from home some of the time. Now, the consensus seems to be has been kind of foaming, homing in on around two days per week. And in fact, our own survey, which is shown on screen, uh, suggests that the average is about 2.4 days for those that work uh, a full five day week. And the graphic that I've used on screen kind of illustrates where employees state that they want to work. Um, and it kind of gives that support to the growth of hybrid working with people choosing to work in the office, from home or anywhere in between. And you can also see from the graphic that it shows that actually only a quarter uh, want to work from the office exclusively. It kind of supports, I suppose, the, the Gallup survey that Robin mentioned. Um, but that actually the majority actually wants a range of alternative options, which could very well be working from home. It could be working within a, a flex environment or indeed in what we, we term kind of a third space, so for example, a coffee shop, um, for example. I think though, what's really important to say is that even at this stage, we can't really say with certainty what the real scale of that, that shift to home working is likely to be. Um, I think we need to look over the, the kind of longer term over a full business cycle rather than just this unique period of the pandemic as we return to the office. And of course, it also really depends upon the employer and it's the, their own individual corporate strategy. And the graph that I've put on screen on the right is actually taken from the ONS uh, Business Insights and Conditions Survey, which is the survey that the, that the government had been doing regularly throughout the pandemic. Um, and it just shows that, for example, a third of companies in Scotland, for example, intend to use home working um, as a permanent business model compared to a UK average of 28%. And I think what those figures and those, that data kind of um, suggests is it kind of supports that hypothesis that perhaps in the long term, wholesale working from home um, won't necessarily be the norm and therefore we're not necessarily likely to see a significant decrease in demand for offices. The same ONS survey also shows quite distinct uh, trends by sector and obviously suggests as we would expect that not uh, one size doesn't fit, fit all and I think that's also been evidenced by the range of solutions and proposed working practices that have been publicly um, declared by numerous large uh, uh, scale uh, large global corporates through their kind of state uh, 
press release and, and public statements. And on screen here, we've just mapped out those, those kind of global uh, statements um, to kind of show that kind of hybrid continuum, that kind of spectrum um, of potential office uh, or, or, or work solutions, really. And you can see it ranges from those that are adopting a, um, a fully virtual office um, to companies expecting everyone to be back in the office on a full time basis. I think the thing is that many companies, particularly uh, particularly tech companies, have changed their attitude to the office the longer that the pandemic has continued and the more that their employees have been forced to work from home. And there's been an increasing recognition that the office does have a big role to play in future strategies. Uh, and that it's really important um, for businesses in terms of the, the ability for collaboration and communication, for example. But I think what we have seen though, over the course of the pandemic is a much more forensic analysis of the role that the, uh, the, role that the office will have in the future. You know, I think there's a, you know, an acceptance that the office is no longer the default option, um, but it will probably be a place that's a, a better for certain tasks to be carried out, that the better be carried out in the office rather than at home. Um, and we've also seen that from the surveys that we've done, and again on screen, here, here's another, another answer. Um, and it shows that really the employees are relatively split about whether the home or the office is a better working environment for much of their work. But I think this, um, this graph also shows that there is that uh, real kind of consensus that the office does provide that better space for collaboration um, management tasks and problem solving. And I think this view that where people choose to work depending upon the tasks of the day is expected to lead to a number of new strategies to transform office portfolios in that post-COVID environment. And one of these I think is really going to be that drive to flexibility which we've obviously seen for a number of years but I think it's expected to increase post-COVID. And before the pandemic, we were starting to see companies increasingly adopt a kind of core and flex model to provide agility into their, into their office portfolio. And we know that large corporates are becoming the, the kind of the main target for many flex providers. As we move into this post COVID uh, working environment, I think it's really obvious that flexibility is being embedded into uh, many firms uh, portfolios, either as a short term solution to the current uncertainty or as a much longer uh, term strategy to, to allow that kind of uh, ability to kind of flex, uh, um, uh, sorry, to expand and to contract more easily. And again, that was demonstrated in one of our workplace surveys, uh, which showed that the increased use of flex space was going to be the most frequently cited strategy for portfolio transformation post COVID. And you can see that almost a, a quarter of those that were surveyed said that the use of flex space is going to be that, that most important strategy um, in that post COVID world. I think when we talk about the, the future of the office and the future of office demand, there's, there's been quite a simplistic narrative so far in that, that more home working really will equal less office space. And I think it's quite naive in, in some ways to, to come to that conclusion. You know, we have the issue that many uh, employers as they return to the office will be expecting perhaps more space, uh, less desk sharing. And, you know, we're also going to see that firms are going to need more collaboration and meeting space because that's obviously going to, as we've just seen, will be the primary focus of the office. And that's going to impact on office densities um, and we can start to see more actually more space allocated per person, although that may be obviously potentially based on a smaller headcount. But I think the thing with as people start to return to the office, we're going to definitely see days that are busier than others. And there's a, a number of occupancy surveys out there that would typically show that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays are the busiest days in the office. So if you've got this kind of peak occupancy, that's going to erode the amount of space that companies can actually save. Um, so I think, you know, there's a real kind of key unknown uh, around when we return to work as to whether companies can actually manage that attendance over the week. And I think that hybrid working is probably going to throw up a whole new set of management challenges that will need to be considered over time. So I think what this means is that some companies may in fact see an increase in their office uh, footprint, um, while others may actually see a reduction. And this is shown quite clearly on the pie charts, again, from the ONS survey, which actually shows that overall uh, some proportions of companies are expecting to reduce their footprint as increase it. But again, as I said earlier, you know, this is very much going to be dependent on the sector, as again, you can see from the, the, the pie charts at the top and also by the, the size of the company. I think what the pandemic has done um, is also focus attention on the optimum location and quality of office space. And that message is coming through loud and clear from our occupier clients. Um, uh, and that, you know, they're looking at uh, the demand for high quality office spaces and likely to be focused around key hubs. Uh, and we're actually starting to see many companies disposing of secondary assets or assets in secondary locations. 
Again, on screen, another uh, uh, result from one of our surveys shows that half of those that were surveyed expect to increase the proportion of higher quality stock in their portfolios. And as those go through, companies go through a rationalization process, they're very increasingly going to be focused on keeping or increasing that better, better quality space within their, their office footprint. And I think what this means is that we're going to start to see a polarization in performance between good quality space and the rest. As occupiers start to focus on things like health and well-being, sustainability, the use of smart technology, and start to release space in secondary assets that really can't accommodate those changes. And I think that secondary space really will start to run the risk of becoming in, um, increasingly obsolete over time. So what we expect is that office design is expected to change as employers look to use space to attract people and their employees back into the office. And again, while not necessarily new trends, I think they're likely to accelerate over the next few years. I think one of the kind of legacies of COVID-19 uh, will be the preeminence of employee health and well-being, uh, which again, you can see from this graph on screen, comes out as the top priority for investment ahead of things like technology. Uh, and this uh, focus on health and well-being is likely to impact on the design and means and services offered in the workplace. And I think that's something that Charlotte's going to touch on in more detail in a minute. We're also expecting to see an increased focus on environmental credentials um, of space. As we've gone through the pandemic, uh, this has really kind of been exacerbated and firms are really um, facing growing pressure from their investors and stakeholders to kind of embed sustainability into their kind of core business strategies. And we're starting to see occupiers um, consider the, their kind of wider ESG goals um, in terms of the kind of the, the assets they, they occupy and the locations they're in. And I think that again, that's been evidence that being magnified during the pandemic. And I think as we enter this kind of recovery phase, I think it's going to become increasingly evident that companies are no longer um, prepared to consider um, occupying environmentally damaging buildings. And we fully expect that there'll be an increasing prevalence of corporate mandates towards sustainability certification, with Brian particularly becoming a more, uh, a more prominent deciding factor, at least in the short term. And this is borne out by another survey that we've done over the summer called the Responsible Enterprise Survey. And that showed that actually 45% of those that we, uh, we surveyed already prioritise uh, building credential certifications, with another 40% expected to implement this by 2025. So this, I think, is going to lead to that kind of um, that further polarisation in the demand for office space over the next few years. So, so that's a very quick um, canter through some of those, those trends. So I think really quickly to, to sum up, I think hybrid working uh, is going to be a real uh, key characteristic of how and where we work in the future. But of course, you know, what was that? that doesn't really mean the death of the office. Um, you know, the office is still going to have a really critical part to play, or albeit maybe a potentially different role uh, in corporate real estate strategy. But I think those new requirements and the, that, that kind of key focus um, from our occupier clients is going to lead to that flight to quality and a focus on prime space and locations um, with that need for greater flexibility. So I hope that's uh, set the scene and back to Robin. Elaine, thank you for that. That was uh, very insightful. As you mentioned, employee health and well-being is a, a, a very considerable part, considerable part of the focus going forward. And uh, Charlotte's now going to touch on that um, with five minutes or so, Charlotte. Yes, thank you so much, Elaine. And it's it's really encouraging um, to see that although our take on, on the research is slightly different, that there, there are many synergies. Um, so as a business, we are undertaking a survey um, each quarter in 2021 of um, 2,000 participants, um, and they are representative of, of the UK. Um, the reason why we're doing it each quarter is so that we can track how um, sentiment changes as we emerged in um, January um, going through uh, Q1 coming out of lockdown. And so we'll see how it, it follows. At the end of the year, um, we will be able to uh, kind of culminate those 8,000 respondents um, and, and track uh, what the year has been like. The basis of our survey is about um, whether people are currently thriving, where the communities are thriving um, in the context of spaces and places. So um, just a few slides to, to kind of take you through that. Um, so we asked people uh, a multiple choice question around what they thought thriving meant to them. Um, 
The words that we used were happy, secure, energized, inspired, valued, and connected. And as you can see, uh, Scotland and the UK as a, as a whole track the same importance for each of these um, different words, associations. Um, and I think what's interesting is that inspired and connected are slightly lower in the Scottish market. Um, why is that? Well, uh, maybe just people placing more, more value on being happy and secure and so on, but also maybe that not being the top of mind when they're answering these questions. And I think talking about connections and talking about inspired, being inspired are very much elements that um, come to us through being in an office. Um, so those were multiple choice questions. And then we went on to ask people a free form question about their definition of thriving. So you can imagine, you know, they each had three, three answers. So 2000 people with three answers, there's a lot of data in there. And what's coming up time and time again is um, if people feel healthy and they feel um, that their well-being is taken care of, then they feel like they are thriving. Also happiness, very much in the same vein. So that kind of backs up how important it is for people to feel happy. Um, success, this is very much about uh, per, you know, success in the workplace, feel like you're moving up in the world. Um, and that throws up some questions around, um, you know, is it possible to feel successful when you're sitting at home on your own? Um, is it possible to kind of create a career and, and build um, around what you do? Um, personal growth is really important to people. And then we go into contentment and, and security. Security also encompasses job security. And then when we look at um, factors supporting an individual's ability to thrive, um, very much correlating with the investment that Elaine mentioned, and that's that's a good thing. And thankfully, um, if we look at just the, the kind of pinky red here, so this is the UK, um, very important factors, and Scotland is here in yellow. So the, the Scottish people as a nation are really ranking mental health um, the most highly, you know, more highly than the rest of the UK and then close second physical health. And then coming down here to time to yourself, also tracking um, ahead of the UK and the space that I work in. So interestingly, the space that I work in is still important to people, but not as important as these other factors. So I guess I don't have the answers. It's more about putting the questions, questions out there is if the space, the actual physical space is less important than mental health and physical health, and even pr privacy and time to have on your own within the office environment. How do we as, as office providers and developers and people involved in the development of these spaces and places actually bring those into being, into amenity culturally within in these spaces and places? Um, there's a lot on here and I apologize, but wanted to get it all together. So um, we've come up with individual Thrive Schools and community Thrive Schools. So what's interesting is as we emerge from Q1 into Q2, it seems like people are thriving more, not really that surprised. Um, the score is uh, 44, so zero being not thriving at all and 100 being you know, fully thriving. And what's interesting is that communities, um, this, is, this is nationwide, communities are thriving um, 60, score of 60, both in Q1 and Q2. Um, so what can we see from this? That community thrives over and above the individual. And if we think of offices, and if we think of going to work and our co-workers, they really are a community to us. And culturally, that's going to become, we feel that's going to become more and more important in the future is if people are working desk sharing hybrid 
working, time swapping, goodness knows what in the future. How do we still foster that sense of community amongst co-workers? And that's so important for job retention, keeping talent, and of course, for well-being and mental health and those interactions and, and sparks that fly when you collaborate with people in the office. Just to turn to Scotland, um, really good news in that the Thrive score was 37. Um, so well in Q1, so below um, the, the rest of the UK and jumped six points, one of the biggest jumps that we saw. Um, so as individuals, people in Scotland felt like they were, they were thriving more. And then um, what's also great news is that the Community Thrive score actually increased over and above the rest of the UK. So there is value being placed on community in Scotland. There's value um, about looking out for one another because those are the kind of questions that were involved in coming, um, coming to the school. And then my final slide, so it's a little bit of uh, repetition about, um, I, I guess, what Elaine was, was presenting. Um, so we also asked people about working from home and so on. So in brackets is the UK. So just to go through this, so currently in Scotland, so this is the end of Q2, um, on average, people were working from home 1.9 days a week. The expectation in the future was to work from home 1.6 days a week. Um, and 53% of respondees currently are working full time in the office or on site and expect to continue to do so in the future. 22% uh, are currently working from home full time. And 13% expect to work from home full time in the future. So what's interesting about this is there's Compared to the rest of the UK, um, it seems like the Scottish population are working from home less and expect to work from home less than the rest of the UK. So I guess that's a really positive you know, story for and case for office demand. Yes, we have to, you know, we have to note that it depends on what type of work people are doing and so on, and we would caveat that. But certainly there's this expectation about working more um, from an office or on site or whatever it might be. And then um, I think what's really important on, in all of this research that we've done is 81% say that having a choice over where they work is important to their well-being. And so this is coming up time and time again. It's about flexibility, it's about options, it's about choice, it's about how the setup works for people. And obviously there are very many demographics within here. There's people with children, there are young people who want to go to the office and need to go to the office to learn you know, their skill. Um, but really, I, I think that's what I would, I would end on is, is that what, what we've had a taste of in the last 18 months and more is this idea of flexibility. We've had to have trust from our employers. We've had to, you know, people have had to trust that they, their workforce is getting on and doing it. And so the question, I guess, is what is the right blend and, and, and is it prescriptive or is there flexibility built in? And that, I think, is it for me. Oh, and, and so it's, in summary, sorry, is um, I think the challenge is how do we create places that are healthy, that are happy, that have a culture where people are, are set for um, success, where they feel they can succeed, where experience of, you know, where they can experience personal growth and feel contentment, and, and spaces in, in the office environment where people feel secure. And then the next level is how do we integrate well being in terms of mental and physical health um, and, and filtering down from that spaces where people can exercise, spaces where people can have quiet time, and also foster spaces where interactions and creativity can take place. Thank you.
Charlotte, thanks for that. I um, I had a whole set of different things I was going to ask Stephen there, but you've just ended on a really interesting point, which is how do we create healthy, happy spaces with a culture for success and exercise and so on? And actually, Stephen, how do we create those spaces? We are creating them, um, he says, very egotistically and boldly. Um, I, I think if I can jump back just slightly, I, I, think, I think the biggest challenge is that the, the pace of change is so rapid. And I think both Elena and Charlotte have, have summed up really well um, in, in terms of that rapid change. And, and there isn't a defined answer. And there's certainly not one size fits all. Um, it's different across different sectors. Um, it's, it's also a, a continued period of change. Um, I, I really feel for corporate real estate execs just now who are, who are trying to take that fixed asset, which is a, a property requirement in your, in your need for space, um, and, and try and make that fit this, this continually evolving and, and, and changing requirement. Um, it, it, it's not easy. Uh, but going back to the specific question, the wellness was here pre-COVID. Um, the, the desire for sustainable spaces was here pre-COVID and all of that's accelerated. Uh, and, and those that have been providing products that were already on that journey uh, are the products that will succeed. So um, you need to create outside space. Um, um, I'll, I'll refer to 177 because it's our, our current development, but our, our we got an 8,000 square foot terrace on the roof. The ability to get off your seat, um, no matter who you are in the building, and go out and get some fresh air without having to leave the building. Um, well, that's for a walk, well, that's for some exercise, well, that's for some quiet contemplation. Um, the, the, the connection with nature, the fact that that's heavily landscaped, so though you're in a, a thriving and bustling city centre, um, you're in that, that little oasis uh, with, with, some, with some clean air. Um, so it, it can be done. Um, I think internally, the workplace, re remembering always that form should follow function. So how people are using their office space is changing. Ultimately, we create a, a blank canvas uh, and we create that as, as simplistically as we can um, and make that space as flexible as it can be. So um, each different user will use it in a different way. So our uh, Virgin Money as a, as a bank will occupy the space very differently uh, than, than how CBRE uses it. At CBRE are bringing three businesses together for the first time and they're three very different parts of the business and they have very different requirements uh, and that's reflected in their fit out. Uh, but people are designing fit outs now to be much more flexible because they know what they design today will not be what they need tomorrow and then the next day and, and it will change over time. Um, and that's a lot of that is driven um, by smart tech, um, the, the ability for an occupier to real time determine how they're using their space. So it's not anecdotally, we don't have enough meeting space, we have, don't have enough desks, we're not using the, the space correctly. Um, being able to have that information real time that will allow occupiers to determine how they're using their space and how they're, how they're not using their space will allow that space to adapt and change over time. So it, it can be done. Um, there's a lot of work to do and, and it will change. Um, 177 is a very interesting case study because clearly the the design of that starting a drawing board, I'm guessing probably four years ago, way pre-COVID um, and pre-any thought of what we're going through. And I think your start on site was even prior to, to COVID. So how much of that design is embedded as just good practice and actually the industry is heading that way anyway? And how much over the last 18 months have you had to pretty agile development changes and design changes to, to, to bring it up to a post-COVID world? So I suppose part of it is how much of it is a well-being path that we're already on and how much of it has been altered by what we've been through? Um, a really good question. I think both Elaine and Charlotte summed up at the start. I mean, the COVID has just super accelerated the trends that were already here. Um, so designing the building nearly five years ago, uh, is, is when we started that journey, the, the demand for wellness was there, the demand for sustainability was there, the demand for flexibility was there. Um, the, the fact we've been delivering serviced offices for 30 years, um, way before you could elevate the world's consciousness, as somebody famously once said, um, is so, so serviced office and flexible office space isn't new. We've been doing it for 30 years. Um, it's just that it's becoming much more prominent. 
Um, the, the, the ability, um, again, Elaine talked about core and flex, ability to, to, to mix that longer term core requirement with the, what you need today with the flexibility uh, over time, the, the, the input and um, implementation of our service base within our building works. It gives our occupiers ability to, to mix and blend that core and flex base in the same building. Um, in terms of changes to COVID, um, the biggest change um, is uh, touchless and, and the fact that we took the decision to, to, to change a number of small things, but important things, so that you could get externally out of our building um, from any of our entrance point all the way through the building, through reception, um, through our speed gates into lists to your front door without touching any part of the office. Uh, the fact that when you visit the little person's room, the soap and the water and the hand dryer um, are again all touchless. And even the bits that we can't make touchless, like the, the, the handles and the toilets are antimicrobial. Um, it's, a, it's a copper alloy that still looks like stainless steel, but it kills bacteria uh, within two minutes after you've touched it. So it's those were relatively minor changes, but important changes around, around COVID. But inherently, that flexibility, that wellness, um, the, the running track in the roof uh, and all the other stuff that comes with it, the, the extent of cycle spaces, the, the spa quality changing, um, all of that was there. Um, it's just become much, much more important. It's just much higher up um, occupiers' agenda. Uh, the, the biggest two clearly for us, wellness um, and, and sustainability, which is great. We, we, the, the positive we should be taking from COVID is the fact that sustainability now is not just a nice to have as it was three years ago uh, or so when, when people talked about it, but didn't really reflect it. It's an absolute given. And it's been driven by not just the millennials, but by staff, it's it's people will choose the business that they work for because of their sustainability, and and people's office, whether whether they like it or not, is a reflection of their business, not just in how it physically looks, but but its contribution to their their staff, its contribution to community, and its and its contribution to the planet. Um, so, yeah, there there has been change, but we're already there, and thankfully we're accelerating the good stuff. Stephen picked up on a, uh, a point there that um, a lot of this has been driven by staff and it's been driven by individuals, Charlotte, and clearly your research is, is, is based on that aspect and what people think and what people want. The one thing that always worries me is that um, mm -hmm. if I were to ask my once 12 year old son if he wanted McDonald's every day, he would have McDonald's every day. Not necessarily good for him, it's not sustainable. How much of that about home working and wellness is what people perceive to be what's good for them, but actually in the long term for either their careers, their wellness, how much of that, how do you separate all that as to actually what is the ideal and what works? Yeah, and I think I think that's why we ask the question the, about what thriving means to people in many different ways. We, we lead the witness, but we also ask free form questions and we see and correlate what rises to the top. And I think we need to be quite careful about wellness as a term because or well-being or whatever you know people are calling it, um, because it means different things to different people. So for some people, going to the gym makes them feel well, and for others, reading their book on the roof terrace of 177 for half an hour in their lunch break and being quiet really contributes to their well-being. So we're all about people, we're all about asking people. And I know the context of this conversation is, is also about, I guess, maybe not smaller spaces, but more, you know, sophisticated offices, so to speak. So that would kind of also be a bit of my question to Stephen about what do SMEs do? Um, but anyway, not going off topic is, is you know, we, we've seen, I think it's a million, is it a million vacancies, job vacancies? It's so hard to recruit talent at the moment and retain them. And so what I would say is that it, it, it's not a fad. Well-being is not a fad. It's exactly what Stephen said. It's been here for a long time and it's going to continue there's no two ways about it but you have to ask your people what they want and and what works for them and and so that's exactly what Stephen is saying and I don't think 
Um, I think there's ways of asking people that throws out answers. Do you want a swimming pool? Yes, everyone's going to say yes, a rooftop pool, you know. But there's, there's according to what the business can do and provide in terms of their own financial resource and space, um, focus group with your, with your team, sit down, say these are the options, do lead around what is available or, you know, potential. But, but certainly ask, ask your workforce and ask your people what, me, what, what thriving means to them um, so that you can create those spaces around them. And if you are a small business, you know, it doesn't have to be a running track. There may be other things that you can do um, that really just add that happiness or that, that contentment to people that we're talking about or that, or that feeling of, of, of wellness. Elaine, we're very clearly in a process of evolution and, you know, mm -hmm. we're probably discussing something that's going to be live for quite a while uh, yet, but the points that both Stephen and, Lee, uh, Stephen and Charlotte have brought up about the pace of change and reacting to change, how much different do you think your report might be in 12 months or 18 months, or do you think we're on a path of a trend that will continue? I suppose, are there black swan events that are going to change significantly, or do you think we are just evolution as opposed to revolution I think you said at the very beginning it was more of an evolution than a revolution and I think I would probably agree and as you know as Steve has eloquently put it and I think I mentioned it that a lot of the trends that we're seeing have been evident for quite some time it's just been that acceleration um, of, of those trends and I suspect that as we come out of the the, uh, the pandemic into that recovery phase there'll be those, those trends will continue to be focused on the, the pace of change may slow down a little bit um, as, we, as everyone get, reacts to getting back in, into the office and into their kind of whatever, and I hate the term, into the new normal. Um, but, you know, the, they, they will be then focusing on everything that has happened in the, in the pandemic to understand how they can um, make the, that work for a better working environment for, for their, you know, the, for their, their staff, et cetera. Um, so I suspect we'll still be talking about the same issues. I mean, we all know the property industry, um, you know, basically it, it, um, responds relatively slowly. Uh, to, to, to changes uh, in in in, uh, in the economy and and and, and into in, into everyday life, um, so, so I think we'll we'll still be talking about those in, in 12, 18 months. Um, perhaps the priorities may change a little bit um, as we come out of of, uh, of the, the COVID environment. But um, yeah, I think you know we will still be talking about sustainability. I think that's the one area that will be um, you know I think has come to the fore to a greater extent. Um, post pandemic I know people were still talking about it pr previous to that but I think people were paying a little bit of lip service to it um, but now I think there's been a real focus uh, on that and you can see that in terms of things like the number of companies who are you know de publicly declaring their um, their sort of sustainability ambitions whether it's signing up to uh, yeah. net zero carbon sustainable uh, science-based targets etc so I think you know that's that's the direction of travel and I think that's perhaps where the emphasis will be as we, as we move forward. I, I suppose I've, I've this shift towards what employees want and how people want to work. Um, is that likely to take a further step? Whereas historically cities have always functioned because people want to live close to where they work. Well, we start to see an evolution where businesses locate themselves close to where people want to live. So are we likely to see a growth in suburban offices? Um, are you expecting the, your business parks in Lanarkshire to, to see further growth, Stephen? Is the, are we likely to see a a diminishing of the city centre or does the city centre as a place endure? And I suppose that's a question for all of you from, from the different prospects. We'll pick up with you um, first on that, Stephen. It's a really good question. Uh, there's, there's lots of discussions about hub and spoke models and, and retaining a smaller city centre presence and then have a number of, of hubs um, in, in, the, in the outskirts city, more, more rural, um, and that brings you closer to your workforce. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that necessarily will work, and I'm not sure we're really seeing any any evidence of that. People, some people already do it. We've we've got occupiers that have got city centre space with us and um, out of town uh, space, and, and they and they mix both. Um, we've the, the reverse of that is the, the 15 minute neighbourhood or a 15 minute city, um, and and the desire to get more residential in our city centres and and be, making it um, by its very nature more sustainable because you can do everything within within that short period of time. Um, but we saw a mass exodus of people from city centres out to, to the country when, when COVID hit, when people didn't want to be in their two-bedroom flats without a garden, um, when, when there was a, such a desire for outside space when they, were, when they were cooped up for so long. Um, 
So I, I think it will be a mix. Um, the, 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 there was an urbanisation um, uh, probably in the last two or three years um, before COVID, where, where there was a, a definite move to city centres uh, and, and more of a focus um, there. Um, but the demand for, for out-of-town space um, um, didn't diminish. It was just more demand for in-town space. So I, again, I don't see a fundamental change. They'll, 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 they'll still people will still take city centre space for, for HQs um, and, and business models that don't need that will continue to take space um, uh, in, in business parks. The demand for our service space, to go back to I think the question Charlotte asked about how do, how do SMEs fit into all of this, um, SMEs can still take space in 177. We have our, our serviced office in there, so it's not just for the big corporates. The SMEs can, can get a bite of that action too. Um, but the demand for, for our service space and, and flex space over the past pandemic um, has, has pretty much continued um, and, and remains exactly the same, um, which is a, a, a very fortunate position for us to be in. I'll, I'll come back to that. Charlotte, from your perspective, I mean, I, I appreciate you don't ask people that exact question, do you thrive in a city centre environment? But is there something about cities that will continue to draw people back or can you see a, a more an urbanisation of the, uh, or a suburbanisation, I suppose, of the office markets? Yeah, I mean, we we work a lot in residential as well. So, um, I, and all I can really give is my anecdotal evidence of going into London yesterday and being blown away uh, by how busy Waterloo, London Waterloo Station was, the tubes. And I went to meetings and onto one of our sites in the city. And it, I mean, it, it felt 80% uh, full to me. Um, and I could see people having lunches and business lunches and having glasses of wine because it was sunny and, you know, a couple of beers and so on. So, uh, yeah, I, I think cities will, will prevail. We only need to look to historical times when there were wars, when there was, I mean, you know, going back, people fled and people came back. There's an energy about cities, there's a draw, there's a creativity there's art and culture. And as humans, we, we, we do thrive on, on that stuff. But really to Stephen's point, matching that with nature and the ability to have clean air and clean spaces. So um, yes, that's, I, I, I think cities will prevail. And I think if we go back to what we said about flexible ways of working, you know, an individual's home and a, a good setup and a workspace for those of us who, who work in residential development and office development, you know, creating spaces where people can work from home or if we're creating new residential buildings, co-working spaces in the buildings, and we have evidence to show that people would use them, but would also be going, uh, going into their offices. I can't see people wanting to go down the road in their local village and, and work from a, you know, hub and spoke model necessarily. I would, in my personal opinion, it would be at home or, or going to the office um, more predominantly. I think you make a very interesting point there about collaborative spaces, particularly in the built market. Will we see um, high rise apartment type developments with more workspace and collaboration space and how does that all evolve? Can I just jump back a second because um, Stephen you brought up about flex space and it was um, very clearly in some of your slides, Elaine, you were talking about the need for corporates to have flexible space that allows them to grow and contract. Are we about to see a real shift away from long um, institutional leases to much more short, I suppose, much more like the American model? Are we going to see 18 month, three year leases or are we going to see intermediate service office companies coming in and, and providing that space? How is Flex going to work? How do you see it working, Elaine? And then we'll come to you in the same question, Stephen. Well, I say I think you've already that, that those kind of trends have already started. I think, you know, flexibility has, has been around, as Stephen said, for, for quite some time. But we've started seeing uh, standard leases come down in terms of the average lease length. So I think the average lease length is now, you know, close to eight years rather than obviously you know, when I started in property back in the, the 25 year leases. Um, but we're starting to see a lot of landlords move into into that 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 space um, in terms of things like providing plug and play. Um, to provide that that short those short shorter term leases um, that perhaps some of their, their tenants perhaps the SMEs or uh, tenants requ require so it allows them to to move in much more rapidly so the traditional landlord is already changing their, their kind of business model and their, their offer 
um, to, to, to provide that flexibility. Um, so I think it's just going to become, you know, part and parcel of the way that the, the, the real estate uh, market works. It just provides more, um, more choice, I suppose, uh, for individual companies where they want to go to a traditional flex provider, stay within their, their, uh, their, their landlord's portfolio, for example. Um, so I think, you know, it's it's something that's going to, um, you know, st- will continue. Um, and I think there'll be, it's a range of, of, of solutions for a, a range of, of occupier types. I'm very conscious we've not looked at the results of the poll. So, um, Kirsty, can we bring up on screen the results of what um, our various viewers were, were, were keen to have as their future? We asked whether... Um, what you'd want to be doing in six months' time, but it was all the time. So there we go. All of the time, 2%. More than half the time, 20%. 36%. 42%. And my screen's not big enough to see the bottom one. If I could do the maths quickly, nobody thinks, nobody wants to be uh, 0%. Um, the next one. So this is where we think we'll be, and this is will be the interesting comparison, I think. Where do we think we will be working in six months' time? <laughs> the suspense is killing us. I think what we've learned today is that there's only one thing that's certain in life, more certain than death and taxes, and that is that technology will let you down. We'll move on. Definitely. I'm not sure if that slide's coming up, but um, I think as we move towards summing this up, firstly, I want to apologise to the audience for the, the issues we've had today. And um, for not having more Q&A, uh, I think this is a, a debate that could continue and I'm sure will continue in offices and pubs and dinner parties across the country for many months to come. But I just want to ask each of our panellists, where do you want to be working in six months' time and where do you think you'll be working? Stephen, I know you what your answer is going to be, but I'll let you kick off. Um, I, I still wear a shirt and tie, as you can see, so I'm very old school, Robin. Um, I, I, I very, very quickly, I guess, I, I've got a great setup at home. I've got, a, I've got an office in the house. I've got commercial Wi-Fi. I've got a big touchscreen TV, a big commercial printer. So I've got an office from the office. But I still desire to be nearly 100% of my time in the office because as a, as a business, um, we work much better when when I can collaborate with my construction colleagues, with my management colleagues, uh, with the members of my team, uh, with our management guys, with our IT guys. Um, we are we are much better together, and it's just a, a, a statement of fact. And I have no issue saying when people that know me know my work ethic. Um, productivity drops uh, at home. For some people, it doesn't, um, but for me, it did. And not because I was working less. You actually feel you're working more, but your output. Uh, and, and productivity means about output. And if and if I can, if I'm not outputting as much as I as I can in the office, then it's not the place that I should be spending my time. Um, and that's before you got into um, younger members of staff mentoring, um, training, and development, which is yeah, that's, really important. That's, Sorry, I'll stop. No, no, that's. I think your your point about right, young people is very well made, and I think that's critically important. Charlotte, where are you going to be working? I have a, a little toddler, so. Working from home in terms of childcare, seeing her, um, you know, all of that really works for me at the moment. So my circumstances are a bit different. But certainly, um, I think as a business, we're all working remotely at the moment. And by in six months' time, I would imagine two days a week, we will have a hot desk in co working as a small business within a, a larger kind of. Um, operator like a, a office group or whoever it might be so yeah I would say kind of two two days in the future with my team bearing in mind the rest will also be with meetings with clients so yeah, yeah. and Elaine from your perspective um, well I'm going to start going back into the office uh, next week I have been a bit uh, less fair about it up to, uh, to this point um, and I suspect that I'll be going in probably 50% of the time. Um, JLL have introduced a kind of flex for your day policy. So the idea, a little bit like I was discussing in the presentation is that you kind of choose the best environment for the tasks that you're, you're undertaking yeah. for that particular day. Um, and I suppose working in research, spend a lot of time writing reports and looking at data. So there's that, you know, there's a, there's a reason sometimes to, to, to want to be in, yeah. uh, in quiet space, but at the same time, a lot of my job is going out talking to clients and presenting to clients. So actually that's so much better when you're all in the same room. 
uh, so much you get that interaction you get that discussion um and it, it, it's I, I, in fact i did a face-to-face -face meeting on monday for the first time in months and it was such a fantastic experience to, to sit down with with people so i think uh, yeah i think probably about 50 percent of the time and i think that's probably what you'll, you'll start to see across the kind of jll business but i say everyone kind of choosing um where is the best place so again back to the point that was made earlier uh the company trusting people to uh, to choose the best place for themselves full stop uh, we're marginally over time but i just want to, to end by saying uh, thank you to you all for your 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 time today um perhaps Stephen, this time next year you'll be chair of the spf so you can get us all in the room we can have this conversation again see how things have moved on and figure out what's what is for the best but i think overall flexibility is the key flexibility in your own views flexibility in office space and uh, flexibility to switch between a laptop and a phone when technology goes <laughs> wrong but thank you all thank you for joining us today and um we'll see you again soon thank you